Live from our newsroom, it's the Hard Times Podcast! With Bill Conway and Matt Sangum. All right, Issa, welcome to the Hard Times Podcast. How's it All going, right. man? It's going good. I'm excited to be here. This is fun. So this far. is this is like it's like two of my meetings just overlapped, and here I am talking to the <laughs> totally. two people I talk to the most. I know, Matt. I was going to say I barely ever see you these days. This is this is great to be here with you on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. So for people who don't know, Issa and I run a company together called Outvoice. It helps publishers pay their freelance content creators. Bill and I run a company called Hard Times. I bet you you know that one because you're on listening to this podcast. Um, so these are the two dudes who I just. Uh, Zoom call every single day, millions of and times. And now Bill, Bill and I are starting a company. Also, we're going to help <laughs> gang members get placement <laughs> in gangs, <laughs> like LinkedIn. Yeah, it's gang. not to get them off the street or anything <laughs> like that. It's just to get them in the gang that they exactly. Uh, it's actually to go yeah. references and everything you need. It's actually to go collect the money that publishers are paying their freelancers. It's like a reverse outvoice. You, you just go <laughs> rough people up and grab that money for their articles. <laughs> Issa, I had the, we'll get into some podcasty topics soon, but I had the craziest thing happen to be uh, a client that you and I have been in the process of onboarding for a little while, just offered me $1,000 to give a presentation to a larger section of their team. I was like, okay. Yeah. I said, no, like we, I, you said I, make it five, <laughs> but I was, I was so stunned by that. I was like, you want to pay me just to present my idea. He said it was because I had already presented it to a couple other members of their team and he felt bad. But I was like, yeah. man, I was I, like, I, maybe this is like some Silicon Valley thing where they just want to steal our idea. You know, it's like the brain drain or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. I love that show. Um, <laughs> I've always wondered about that brain drain thing. I actually, when we, when we did the hard times deal, we didn't sign an NDA. <laughs> hmm, okay. I don't know if that's important or not. It doesn't sound well, very punk though. I showed them like everything. I showed them like inside of our, our bank accounts and stuff without an NDA. Right. But you know what I thought We had about? to send over full body <laughs> photos of us like in uh, random positions that I I haven't even, you know, my wife hasn't seen them, but uh, oh, wow. it's, okay. yeah, it, this guy knows everything. Is- I think that's yeah. standard business stuff these days, you know. Uh, the thing I was thinking about the NDA was, what are they going to tell? They're going to tell people we're a struggling media business? It's not really a confusing or interesting story, right? They're like, yeah, hey, I'm, man. Not, I'm not <laughs> sure there's any proprietary information in there. Maybe there is. I don't, I don't know. But, you know. It's like, hey, I met these punk guys and these total suckers. They showed me how they lose money publishing punk jokes. <laughs> 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 yeah, they're totally wasting their lives away building this brand. That <laughs> <laughs> <It'll> <laughs> their, their peak creative years have been totally drained on this, but uh, got them. <laughs> yeah, no, that uh, big demand for that in uh, in the Valley these days, I hear. Did you ever sign any NDAs? Uh, he can't the tell Queen you Fund? that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can neither confirm nor deny Uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I don't think I've ever signed an NDA. I think, uh, I feel like I might have at some point, but I don't remember. So, or I'm not allowed to say, I, I don't know. So for people who don't know, Issa, Issa uh, sang in the band Good Clean Fun, which is an amazing early hardcore band uh, that has like satirical <laughs> leanings, which is yeah, actually. I, I just, I, I have to take exception to the early thing. I just feel like we were. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's you know, true. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I I don't mean to sound old, but we were we were definitely not early. I feel what like year we did you guys late start? to the party. We started in 1997. Okay, that's a little okay. late to the party. Yeah. yeah. But you guys are connected still. If you look at some of the bands that you guys are playing with, in you guys I feel like you're part of a scene that relates to an earlier hardcore scene. Um, well, we were good, you were with like an second old wave school. youth crew. We were yeah. second wave youth crew. There you go. Mm. Yeah. I, I would even go so far as to say that we helped start Second Wave Youth Crew. Because uh, oh, here we go. It was, uh, it was <laughs> chugga chugga. I got a I got ten yard fight on the line right now, and they uh, they say otherwise. So, yeah, well, it was, it was pretty chugga chugga until until we came along. Oh, yeah. Okay, Issa, you guys are running here. Issa, you're not <laughs> early hardcore '97. Fair enough, you're Second Wave. Um, but nonetheless, I feel like you played in a very interesting band in part because. Uh, I've always thought about how there's two strains of punk and there's kind of like the super serious side of punk. And then there's like the escapism, uh, fun, satirical comedy, and then sometimes troublemaking side of punk. And you guys have a lot of lyrics uh, that are like, 
it's kind of like proto hard times. Like when people ask me, Hey, you know, uh, what are you know hard times oh i thought punks took themselves super seriously and i want to po- point to earlier things you could point to a lot of good clean fun songs and be like look punk has always kind of been hardcore has always kind of been like this well i think there's a there's a tendency in in straight edge especially and vegan straight edge even more so for people to just start taking themselves too seriously mm-hmm. you know and i think it happened it, you know, before us, there was a band called Crucial Youth who pretty much we completely ripped off and they kind of did the same <laughs> thing. They were there. They, they played a show with Uniform Choice uh, back when Screaming for Change came out and they threw buckets of change at them on stage, like pennies and nickels and stuff. And, uh, you know, that they were they were amazing trailblazers of uh, co- hardcore punk comedy. And we sort of uh, picked up where they left off. So, yeah. So it's like a, there's a long yeah. lineage of, of punks goofing off. Yeah, because you can only take it so seriously. And we we had a little twist because we were actually vegan straight edge kids. And so it was, you know, it was sort of like you had the the Earth Crisis crowd, for lack of a better uh, generic term, who were sort of like, you know, go vegan or else. And, uh, you know, and that's great. I'm all for it. But I think that turned some people off. And we managed to be kind of funny about it, but still have the same message. And I think that... Yeah, the, that's we all about, like to capture some more people that would like, otherwise not be interested. Uh, there's a hilarious song. I forget the title. It's about like like kicking your family members in the face and stuff. All life. Uh, uh, yes, all, in defense of all life. In defense of all life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's a good one. Um, yeah. and, and again, this is I I don't want to pull back the curtain too much because then you realize that that all of Good Clean Fun was just ripping off other things. But uh, that was a complete rip off of a Black Sheep skit. Um, from uh, Wolf and Sheep's Clothing, and okay. uh, where they pretend to be uh, gangster rappers, and so it was, it was, uh, you know, very heavily inspired by that. But <laughs> well, I played in, I played in a comedy infused hardcore band that ripped off things too. Um, so oh, it's, yeah. it's part of the progress. fun. Yeah, zero <laughs> progress. We actually at one point, have you ever seen the movie MacGruber? Oh, I love MacGruber. Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't know that. So um, at one point, we played a show, and I acted out a two or three minute long like scene from a gruber to start oh, the wow. set did you do like a monologue was like it, it wasn't a, even like straight up was monologue. it the why do they hate me monologue it was <laughs> that, that would have been a great one <laughs> it was the one where at some point you have to he grabs someone and he goes I'll, I'll, I'll break his neck and then he goes uh don't worry guys he's with me um fuck i think he do, i think he does this monologue at the party Okay, I haven't seen MacGruber in a long time, but me either. Uh, but great movie. I'll I'll try to think of what I'll sh- I'll send you the the exact scene later. I'm trying to f- think about it, but it was at least two or three minutes long, and our band had watched the movie several times, and we we were just losing our minds in the van. And when we got to this show, we actually played out this whole thing, and the crowd was like stunned. They were like, "What the fuck is this guy doing? <laughs> this is the worst show I've ever been to." Oh yeah, we we had a lot of. Uh, <laughs> We sort of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit with Good Clean Fun because we kept setting these like kind of crazy, crazy goals. And then we would do them, which was awesome. But like people sort of didn't believe us. Like we, uh, when we first decided to go on a world tour, hardcore bands didn't really go on world tours. Mm-hmm. Like this was like 2000. We did, we did like a, you know, Australia, New Zealand, South America, all over Europe and, and uh, North America. It was like, you know, 30 something countries or something. And that was like, I think we were like the first real hardcore band to ever do that. Like, uh, Black Flag. Spice, what was that? Come on, Black Flag. Ever heard of them? I don't think they did like a world tour and I don't think they were like a DIY hardcore band at Right, I mean, like what black like, flag? Yeah, what the time? Band? Black flag is huge. Come oh, on. Oh, okay. Well, I'm talking about. I mean, if you want to talk about DIY touring, you can't not talk about black flag. Although I do not know their history with world touring. I know that as far as uh, U.S. DIY punk tours, they're kind of the innovators there. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, yes, but my obviously lots of punk bands had toured the U.S. So that's mm-hmm. that's sort of the point I'm making. And a few bands had toured Europe quite a bit, but no one had really done like a world tour before. Like Strife had been to Australia. Uh, I think one time before us and that was it pretty much. I mean, I, I feel bad if I'm leaving out some band that had did some trailblazing and other, you know, you know what it is, dude, it's probably that was, yeah. In your scene, that's, that's what happened. I always do this where I say things like that. And it's like, that's because my, 
world of hardcore and punk is like a hundred bands that are like my friends yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah, keep going. <laughs> so I apologize to anyone yeah. out there, you know, put it in the comment section. Uh, <laughs> if I, if I missed you, you know, like we went to Mexico in 2000, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so foot we, toward, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just some, some <laughs> exactly. weird fucked up man. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I, when I was on Bill's old podcast, Edgeland, uh, we talked about how everywhere we went, Fugazi had already been there. Like no yeah, matter, yeah. we could play like some small village in the middle of nowhere. And they were like, Oh yeah, Fugazi's already been here. <laughs> um, and uh, like, but, no more shows for us. We've, we've seen a show before. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, but we, uh, you know, we set out when we did, you know, okay, you've totally taken the wind out of my sails, but when we set out to be like this, the, to do a world tour, we were like really the first hardcore band to do that. That was like a small indie booked it ourselves. DIY mm -hmm. hardcore band, whatever you know, qualifications you want to put on there. But that was awesome. It was, um, it was a great experience. We got to do all this fun stuff. We did all sorts of crazy things like putting out like, you know, multiple covers of different albums with like crazy costumes and stuff and having all these different versions. And then uh, towards the end of Good Clean Fun, I decided to make a movie instead of an album, which, uh, you know, and again, I sort of feel like we had this thing where no one actually believed me. Like there are a lot of people who, who didn't believe that we actually made a feature film. They just think we made a fake trailer for a movie, you know? So that was sort of, uh, it's kind of tough marketing when you have to convince people that you actually did something. You know? uh, so uh, do you ever see the movie Rock and Roll High School? That, of course, that was one of the motivations for, for the Good Clean Fun movie. So yeah, as I was watching it, I was like, Issa likes the same stuff that I like, because it's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember. It was, it was like kind of a cross, the goal was to have a cross between Rock and Roll High School and Say Anything. Those were sort mm -hmm. of the two touchstones. I don't know Say Anything. What? Come on. Bill, uh, do you know that one? What is that? John I mean, Cusack holding up the boom box. Yeah, you've seen uh -oh. that, uh, that scene, but I, I've not seen the meme. Seen <laughs> say <laughs> anything, okay. the all movie right, right. myself. No? Uh, cool. No problem. Um, <laughs> it's just like a, it's a very cheesy love story, but it's, it's really nice and, and cute. Um, and it's a little stalkerish looking back on it all these years later, but uh, what are you going to do is the eighties. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> my movie, hopefully less stalkerish, but uh, it, it was so, funny because we, so I put it out, it came out in like uh, 2010 or so, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually screened it one time in the Netherlands. Uh, of course, final, yeah. On our, of course, yeah. That's <laughs> the most. That's the most hardcore set that I've yeah, ever heard. Yeah. yeah, I made a movie. I screened it one time in the Netherlands. <laughs> you know, it was, it was sort of like, a, you know, like a film festival. Although it was actually a hard. It was our last hardcore show. Uh, you also have a, a German wife, which is a very hardcore thing. You're like, yeah, yes, I fell in love yes. on tour. It screened it in the Netherlands. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot Wait, of so <laughs> on the, uh, that that final show, it's like, hey guys, before we start playing, we're just going to have this ninety minute feature. Uh, yeah, that's all, exactly. Okay. <laughs> that's exactly what did we you did. set out chairs and stuff. We did. Yeah, there were chairs and everything. It was crazy. Did the, did the punks behave or what? Yeah, everyone. Uh, I don't. So, <sighs> how to explain this? I'd never made a movie before. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> <You know? laughs> so a lot of this was like film school for me. It was uh -huh. there. It came out surprisingly well, um, but it's still like, you know, so people had like really weird expectations. Like some kid actually came up to me and was like, this is nowhere near as good as rock and roll high school. And I was like, dude, <laughs> rock and roll high school was like a, you know, $5 million budget movie. And like, you know, had the freaking Ramones in it, you know, of course it's not as good as that. Like, you know, so I'm like, you know, we made this like on a shoestring budget and you know, we're punk kids. What do you expect? So, um, it reminds you know, me a lot of the old, uh, the, uh, low budget horror movies I used to watch as a kid. Me and all my punk friends would get together and we'd watch these horror movies, like trauma um, films and stuff, or, or like yeah, right, uh, just just yeah. movies where yeah. it's like you know, it's just it's not a five million, ten million dollar budget. Yeah, no, I mean it was uh, it was more. I mean the budget was the least of our problems. Most of the problem was just me not knowing how to write a movie in a way that would <laughs> make it interesting and having to learn things on the fly. You know, like for instance you shouldn't have a scene where people just sit in a room and talk to each other for five minutes. You know, uh -huh. um, I actually made that same mistake. Actually. Uh, when you know, we, tr we tried to do a hard times TV. What's show. funny about that is I read your script and told you that <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, whatever, man, but it's, it's a lesson you have to learn yourself. You know, like yeah. it's hard to, it's really hard to see those things until you've been through the editing process, you know, and, or read every screenwriting book on the planet. Um, but, you know, I've, I really felt, so I, I have to tell the whole story. I should back up a little bit. So in 2005, 
we made a music video for the song, the MySpace song. Mm -hmm. And that was like, we had like a pretty big budget to make it, you know, thank you, Equal Vision. And uh, it came out great. Like it was like, uh, my friend Joseph directed it, Joseph Patasol, and he's done a bunch of great videos. Uh, But, you know, it was sort of like my baby in terms of I I planned it out and it came out exactly how I planned it. Like it worked perfectly. I was like, this is amazing. I should make a feature film next. So that was sort of where the idea came from. And then, uh, and then from there, it was just sort of like writing a script and then trying to write it better, (laughs) rewrite it a few times and then figure out how to film it and stuff. There were a million disasters along the way, but it was so much fun. It was definitely like one of the best experiences of my life. Um, For anyone who's been on tour, it sort of felt like, every day of filming was like the first day of tour and your drummer didn't have any sticks and you had to like pick up the merch and like, there were just like a million things to do. And it was so fun. I loved it. That's great. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I've never made a music video. I've done some comedy sketches. I I mostly ones that I did with Ryan and Ryan knew what he was doing. So he would like guide me, but that hard times TV show one, I like kind of took the lead on that one. And I definitely put two, two characters in a room talking for too long. And, yeah, it was the, yeah. the final version came out. Okay. Though. Like I liked the, when you edited Thanks. down, you know, I think I gave you some notes. I don't know if you remember, yeah. but I was like, look, nothing <laughs> happens until this line. So just cut everything before that. You yeah. Know? Ryan tried to tell me too, actually, Ryan, yeah. like when he first looked at it, he's like, you got to cut these, <laughs> this first couple pages. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's really hard to, like, you know, I already said this, so I don't mean to repeat myself, but it's just, they're just, the rules of filmmaking are really simple, but it takes a lot to learn the lesson. You know, you just sort of, you hear the same things over and over. And then finally you're like, Oh, that's what they mean. You know? Um, so I want, I want, I want to talk about your movie a bit, but I, I want to talk about Tila Tequila when you mentioned MySpace. <laughs> so tell me about, tell me about your relationship with Tila Tequila, the hot scoop. <laughs> okay. Hold on. We will We're get talking about all all right superhero Tila Tequila. No, yeah, no, Issa, we won't. Issa, we won't get to that. We're I, at that. <laughs> this is the Tila Tequila part of the podcast. So, <laughs> so, but really quickly, just finishing up. Uh, so the reason I, I, uh, you know, the reason I am talking about the movie at all because it was you know 10, 12 years ago, uh, is because I'm put. I'm, my pandemic goal was to get it up on YouTube. So as this comes out, it will be available for free on YouTube. So everybody. Did you do more editing on it or something, or, or were you? I, I didn't it? really. I thought about it, but I was like, it would just be too much work, and mm-hmm. I, I shortened a few quick scenes, so it's a little different from the DVD version. Um, but it's it's Added not a car chase scene or two in there. Exactly, just, uh, some some Michael helmet. Bay explosions and stuff. <laughs> um, but no, it's it's essentially the exact same. No one will notice the difference. Um, and, uh, that kid in the Netherlands will still not like it as much as he liked (laughs) rock and roll high school. Exactly. You know? Um, but yeah, but, uh, so I'm excited for people to be able to watch it. I was fucking busting up watching the, the scene, uh, when the woman lead comes into the backstage area to talk to you guys. And (laughs) when you say like, not a chance, there's like this scene where like, you like pretend like you're listening. You're like, not a chance. Issa in this movie has turned into like this uh, corrupted version of himself. It's really funny. It's a funny character and uh, <laughs> that I was fucking laughing out loud during that scene. Probably but, because you've heard me talk like that during other meetings, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's, uh, let's get to the well, real heart talk, of the issue we here. We can talk about Tila Tequila. That's fine. Yeah, we let's get to the real heart of the issue here. Let's talk about Issa and Tila Tequila because when I met you, uh, we had some meetings. We're talking about this business thing. And then you like very casually dropped like, Oh yeah. Like I was like involved in putting out Tila Tequila's record. I said, what did you just say? <laughs> because I grew up with Tila Tequila shot of love. Right. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, sure. so tell me about. Okay. So Tila. the year is, uh, we take it back to like 2005 or so, I think maybe 2004, 2005 Tila Tequila was the most popular person on MySpace. And well, uh, Dane she, Cook would have something to say about that. Uh, I know, think she was ahead of him. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I, I, I think recall she was they, the there was there was a fight of some sort between the two of them, but I think she had the lead. And she's yeah, way funnier. Right. She's way funnier than he is. So <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so uh, she also has a punk connection, which you might not know, but What's she uh, she had a bunch of friends who were hardcore kids, mm. and so I met her. Uh, she was in, we were both in the same music video for, uh, for a band called the last of the famous, 
who shot a music video in New York. And it was like, uh, there were a bunch of people that were, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, extras. It was a, it was a boxing match video. It was uh, oh, a per- couple. Purcell was in that band, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was Purcell yeah. and, and a, a uh, bunch Alex of... from American nightmare. Yeah. Alex from good, clean fun. You mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, that's what, uh, that, that, you're right. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Daniel Larson was the singer and uh, Supergrass was in it. Guitar player also named Daniel, but anyway, uh, uh, they uh so they made this video and the plot of the video joseph directed the video and it was uh the plot of the video was uh it was a couple guys in the band playing a video game and then a couple other guys in the band in a boxing ring being the characters in the video game and so tila was the was the ring person who you know who holds up the round card sign uh in the in the ring between rounds uh and i was a corner man for the singer so i think it was uh it was me and one of the uh to- Toby from H2O was in the video and uh, one of the Good Charlotte family people. I can't remember. I think, uh, I, I, anyway. So me and one of the Good Charlotte uh, Matt, guys. Were, Matt needs to know which Good Charlotte guy it is because Matt was, is a I huge Good Charlotte brother, fan. I think it was the brother who isn't in the band. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so w- whatever. Is I, there anyway. a brother that's not in the band? I don't know that much about like Good the, Charlotte. Like the uh, fourth Jonas time. brother. Yeah, exactly. It's it's been a long time. But anyway, Man, that so su- that sucks to be the not successful good Charlotte brother. No, I that's, think he was like he had like a merch company or something. I think he was. I think he was. Doing oh come on, he said he was probably just making the good the good Charlotte merch. It was a it was a sh- riding the coattails deal. That guy doesn't <laughs> know what the fuck he's doing. It's Watch. been a long time. I don't know. I haven't. I I I, I have nothing else to say on that subject. NDA, no, Mr. Issa from good, Mr. Issa from Good Clean Fun calls out Good Charlotte. That's the headline on this podcast. Dude, I love okay, Good keep going. Charlotte. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, so, <laughs> um, sorry, now I've got Good Charlotte songs stuck in my head. So, uh, <laughs> so I met Teal in this video. She was dating a friend of mine, and uh, she wanted to do. She was doing music, and she wanted to do like a DIY music project. Right. Which is super cool. Now you have to ignore like the Nazi Tila that, you know, in recent years, it's hard to do. Back. It's hard to do, it but is, I'll it is try. Hard to do that, you know? <laughs> but if you go back, uh, so she wanted to, she was doing, she, her music was good. I mean, like, I don't know what else to say. Like it was really, I really liked it. So she, uh, I had a record label at the time and, uh, uh, with Ken Olden from, uh, from battery and what was it called? Nation AD. And uh, it was called the Saturday team. Okay. Um, and uh, we, uh, we signed Tila and we, uh, NDA. She, and there was no NDA. Um, <clears throat> there might've been after the lawsuit, but that's just, <laughs> that's just foreshadowing. So we'll get to that. Um, so uh, she, she went to Sweden and recorded like five or six songs for an EP Okay, super mm-hmm. hardcore thing to say. No reason to go all the way to Sweden to do it, but okay, well, keep going. You know, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> you got to get that that ABBA sound, you know, um, or or that refuse sound, whatever. <laughs> you know, maybe that's more audience appropriate. Um, and you know, the two most popular bands from Sweden, ABBA and Refuse. Uh, so uh, she recorded it. It came out great. We were all super happy with it. We were gonna release the record, and then right before we were gonna release it. Uh, she got on a shot. Uh, she did the shot for love or shot, shot at love, shot of love, whatever the Tila tequila thing that Matt likes so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you used, you used to have the poster behind you before you got that new background. But, uh, <laughs> but so she got that and I guess he, she got he, a lot he got of that. He got that signed at a deplorables <laughs> rally back in uh, 2016. <laughs> there you go. And so she, uh, so she, she did that. And then I guess she got all these crazy offers from record labels. And she was like, Hey guys, let's hold off on putting out this EP. And, you know, while I figure out all this other stuff and, you know, you guys will get some money and, and whatever, I'll pay you back for the recording and expenses and stuff. Like we'd, you know, it was like about to come out. We'd already taken out ads and like AP magazine and all sorts of like other places. Um, and so we were alternative like, okay, press? alternative press. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we'd, uh, you know, everything was ready to go. We put everything on pause. One second, one second. Yeah. Do you remember roughly, the, like, how much is how much is an print ad and alternative press cost? That's a great question. I want to say it was about fifteen hundred bucks, but I don't Ooh. remember what that was for mm-hmm. exactly. That it sounds might... like a full pager. 
You get a full pager or you I only don't get a quarter? I don't think we did a full page ad. I, I want to say maybe it ran a few times or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember. It's been, yeah, okay. it's been a long time, but it was pricey, you know, like, yeah. Like I mean, it was supporting magazine. a whole, it was supporting the whole magazine industry. It doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so, uh, so she got, she did a shot at love, got all this attention, ended up signing a deal with, I believe universal, uh, for her music. I don't, I don't know if I got that right. So I apologize if that's not the label, but she put out a song, uh, that I've now forgotten the name, of. <laughs> but she put out, she had like a major label release and totally never ended up paying us for our, for our EP. Right. She was supposed to give us like $10,000 or something. So, uh, we ended up just releasing it. And then she went on this like crazy rant about how it wasn't her. And it was like a fake. Uh, it was like, we were, we were, we made up like a fake version of her, of we got someone to pretend to be her or something and said it was like all this like libelous stuff. Mm -hmm. And so our, our distributor had to pull the record and then that caused like all sorts of problems. And then there was a lawsuit. Um, and so we ended up having to sue her. We didn't want to. <laughs> and then and this is what broke the camel's back and drove her to insanity and Nazism. It, it might have been the, the first, uh, it might've been the first thing. I you kind of see, you kind of see it with the whole, like, that's not me. You've made a fake record about me. That's already sort of tipping the hand as far as like the yeah, mental yeah, state. There, there might've been some other signs, but you know, <laughs> uh, so, so she sued us and we sued her. And it was this whole like stupid lawsuit thing. And, uh, and you know, this was my first experience with like some major lawsuit. Like it ended up being this like federal lawsuit out of Los Angeles. The judge was also trying the case for the rights of the Spider-Man character for like <laughs> Spider-Man movies. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is crazy, you know, but it was, it was really <laughs> fun. Like <laughs> shot of love versus good clean fun. Totally. Uh, well, it was like it was like this really dumb thing because it was like we didn't have any money, so it wasn't mm -hmm. like she could win and it wouldn't matter. You know, like we, you know, when lawsuits are so weird because getting a judgment doesn't really mean anything. You know, mm -hmm. like if you can't collect it, so we had literally nothing to lose, and we were they can, they can garden they can garnish your wages once you. We do didn't get money, have right? wages. We were punks, dude. But don't like, don't they don't they like it like. <laughs> If you owe someone hundred thousand dollars for some sort of judgment like that, <clears throat> and you're a little punk kid, you grow up and you get a real job. Uh, not saying you should, but if you <laughs> if you grow up and get a real job, don't they they can garnish your wages later on? Yeah, you can garnish wages. I don't know how long that lasts for or whatever, but uh oh, is your background falling down? <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, you could theoretically garnish someone's wages. I mean, at the time we didn't have wages, but we also we're completely in the right when it came to the lawsuit. We totally were going to win everything. Did um, you get a real lawyer? Or you get like a public defender or what? No, oh no, no. We we had a real lawyer. Like uh, she was great. Uh, she uh, she was out in L.A. and we met her. I can't remember how we found her, just like on the internet or whatever. Um, but she was basically working for a percentage, so we didn't have to pay her, which was the only way we could have a lawyer. Uh, but honestly, most. Um, I, I ended up learning a lot of legal stuff myself, which was really interesting. It was really kind of funny. Um, and we did like depositions and like uh, all the whole nine, like it, it was exactly like on TV. It was hilarious. Uh, and then uh, it was, it kind of got to the point where it was going to go to trial and the judge was like, this is stupid. You guys should settle it. And so for, you know, now, I, now maybe there wasn't any, maybe I'm not allowed to disclose how much it got settled for. Okay, but Although, did you did you win did, or yeah? Were you yeah? Did you benefit from the settlement? Yes. No. Well, that depends. So <laughs> <laughs> now, if you remember, we originally were only supposed to get ten thousand dollars. So we we got a hundred thousand dollars from the lawsuit settlement, um, which hopefully I'm allowed to tell everybody now. Whatever. Um, and uh, and no, I'm kidding. There was actually no. There was no NDA. It's totally fine. So we ended up with hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Almost all of it went to the lawyer, um, and Tila had to pay her own legal fees. So oh, because it turns out that the lawyer you had worked on a hundred percent commission thing, like <laughs> when you said that it was a percentage earlier. <laughs> no, it was. I think she got like. Uh, I honestly, I honestly don't remember. We ended up getting more than our original ten thousand um, dollars. 
you know, plus the expenses of having to like fly out to LA a few times and stuff like that. But uh, hey, the whole Brent. thing was, was a, was a, it was just stupid. Like the whole thing was really just dumb. Like if she had just said like, you're right, I agreed to give you $10,000. Here's your $10,000. It would have been no problem. But the irony of this whole thing is that the EP she did with us is really freaking good. And her other music wasn't as good. So people should check it out. I looked up the <laughs> the song. I think it may be the song she recorded or that was her hit song was called I Love You that she recorded yes, in I love 2007. You was, what what label was it? Was it Universal? Uh, tequila, tequila. Hey, uh, Issa, one quick thing, uh, like a production thing. Maybe uh, can you try switching back to your <clears throat> other microphone so you go to on the lower left-hand side? Can you make it grab your other mic? I have the normal computer mic and I have this headphone mic. So. Try the normal computer mic because you were okay. using that one earlier. Way better without headphones. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Is that okay? No. Yeah. There's. Oh, actually, it's still there. Okay, so it yeah, is connected. I remember there. hearing it earlier. Uh, okay, cool. But, put, the, put the headphones back in. That, that was you're going to have to hear... So you, you're going to have to deal with a center of shit. Yeah, no problem. So basically, this podcast so far has been like me changing headphones the whole time. We're actually going to edit it so it's just that. We, we had Issa from Good Clean Fun on and we just... And we made him... Did. We tried to see how many times we could get him to change. <laughs> yeah. What if that was part of our podcast where we had like an inside joke where we totally. do it multiple times? Uh, when we had... Um, we had John Joseph from the Chrome Eggs on and uh, I tried to get him to download Audacity and I think he downloaded it, but he like didn't unclick some box that like came with, like a freeware sort of deal when you were downloading it and it like changed his default browser and he called me and he's like, you gave me a fucking virus. <laughs> like you ruined my computer. <laughs> I was like, I swear I did it. It's, uh, yeah. it's just, and then <laughs> someone on, on the phone came and helped him and like, like, no, John, like you just gotta go back to your other browser. Oh, that's I, awesome. I, I, I could over. <laughs> I was on like the the line, and I could overhear John on the phone, like coming through the mic, and Matt just being like, "I don't know, what, I don't know what you're talking about." Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, like he was legitimately like heated. Like, I don't know just what tell the him, fuck this just tell is. Him, just tell him Harley did it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. He was like, he was like, "Podcast is off, man. You ruined my fucking computer." I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think he also believes the coronavirus is fake or something. So whatever. A lot of people do. <laughs> <laughs> that's like i mean <laughs> isa do you because a lot of punk dudes do so isa no, are you gonna vaccinate your kids let me know <laughs> my kids are are vaccinated and uh i've believe... refreshed i've refreshed and <laughs> like kind of surprised to hear it because a lot yeah. of punk dudes we invite on this podcast not so much <laughs> no people I mean, are incredibly last week we had ray capo and he was talking about how he had three friends that vaccinated their kids and they instantly became autistic and uh i was like we i, I should have said like that didn't happen but uh you <laughs> well know. okay okay there are some vaccinations that there are there are some drawbacks to them right it's you know are there yeah, no, there's, if you really, I tried to dig into it. If you really, there are like, even like, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell the story wrong because I'm just remembering from the top of my head. I think it was like, you know, the early, like polio, early versions of like the polio vaccine, like really fucked people up until they fine tuned it. You know, yeah, I'm not, but I'm was, a pro vaccine guy. I, I have yeah. all the vaccines, but there are, there are some drawbacks. I mean, to some do you know what also fucked people up? Polio. Yeah. You know, yeah like, the, the I'm with I'm on the vaccination team. I'm just saying some of, you know, it, it, it could be that some of these people have had negative experiences. So maybe no, obviously some people have had negative experiences yeah. with vaccines. Uh, what you have to think about is it, it's not that a vaccine is going to be a hundred. There's not going to be zero problems, but the problem is if you're, if, you know, if people don't get vaccinated and then all these people die of these horrible diseases, then that's way worse. So, I, you know, like it, uh, obviously the Trump situation is not helping people have confidence in a COVID vaccine. Well, but, so that that's really interesting to me because I feel like it was I feel like it used to be almost a, a right wing thing. But now I feel like a lot of no, no vaccine stuff's always been left wing. Like that's, okay. that's like the crazy left hippie type, okay. people, like the homeopathic medicine. It's okay. also like the weird right wing religious people like the, you know, like, I don't know. God will save me. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Christian exactly. scientists. If you go, I, one time I was reporting and I was going through a book of all the, the dead people in San Francisco and how they all died. And there's actually a whole category just for people who died because they believed in some religion that didn't <laughs> let them take medicine. So it's just like, it's like drowning murder fire 
Christian scientists drowning. <laughs> Christian scientists <laughs> drowning. Oh, murder. Car crash. Yeah, no, it's Three crazy. Christian I mean, scientists. There's a like lot the, of them. <laughs> the thing about autism and vaccines is so interesting. And and I love Ray. You know, I, I'm you know obviously a big big fan. Um, but you know, vaccines happen at certain ages and so do the onset of autism symptoms. Right. So that's the big thing to me yeah. is like, these are happening. Like my, my wife, she has, uh, a niece. So I guess I have a niece as well since I'm married, but she, uh, was non vocal for a while and it came and she didn't start hitting markers around two or three. It had nothing to do with vaccinations. It was exactly. just going to be what you know, was her path in life. Um, so the, the when, beautiful, Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt this tragic it, story about your niece. I, yeah. I, yeah I, I do think that when people like when a child doesn't hit markers, they, people look for something to blame and it's just like, what's the easiest thing? Well, we had outside intervention on my otherwise perfect child. And that is what, you know, stopped mm. it from happening. Oh, Not absolutely. just, I, I think humans have this like, we look for patterns, you know, it's like mm -hmm. a perfectly natural human thing to look for patterns. What you have to actually do is use science, which looks for data. And then you can see that there is no correlation. There've been a million studies that have proved that there's no correlation. And that's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, I did get the flu shot last week and I walked backwards back from the CVS all the way to my house and I couldn't prevent it from happening. I don't know what yeah. the fuck was wrong Bill, with me. But. Is that, that was like a clip from the news, right? Wasn't there someone who was claiming they got a vaccine and that they, they were walking backwards? Wasn't that yeah, a it was a <laughs> complete hoax. Like this woman was just walking backwards. Like saying, walking like, backwards or like they started with their left foot instead of their right foot? Walking no, backwards. She, like, like physic, but she could run forward. <laughs> But she could only walk backwards. And, okay. And yeah. like it was, it turned out to be a complete hoax, but it got a lot of coverage. This was probably like six or seven yeah. years ago. But uh, yeah. Well, okay, so, so just to, to bring bananas. this back to, to hardcore or just whatever, one of the things I found with Good Clean Fun is that if I said something, and I'm sure hard times will have a million stories like this too, if I said something on stage in my serious voice, no matter how stupid it was, half the people would believe it. Like, <laughs> you know, like, after the show, we're going to go hang out with Elon Musk and take off in his, uh, you know, <laughs> SpaceX spaceship. Half the people would be like, oh, how was Elon Musk's trip or whatever, you know? It's like, if you just sound serious, people believe it. And, yeah. uh, oh. and I think Hard Times obviously has that same problem. So I yeah. had a question kind of about good, clean, fun and performing live. Did you feel the need to, since you had humor running through songs and topics, like, did you feel the need to be funny performing live? Was there ever a time it was like, I just don't feel like doing it. Let's just play the songs. Or did you have like this obligation uh, in your head? Well, <laughs> so if anyone's ever been to a good, clean, fun show, it usually consisted of like, you know, if it was like a 30 minute show, there was probably about 15 minutes of music and 15 minutes of me talking to the point where there were constantly people yelling, shut up and play a song. You know, that was a pretty <laughs> common refrain among the non-initiated. Um, so no, it wasn't like I set up to do a stand up routine. There were just a bunch of, a bunch of things to talk about, honestly, like, uh, you know, hard to shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> that makes for a good podcast guest though the the reverse is uh when people don't want to talk those are the hardest podcast guests right um yeah so the thing i was thinking about with the uh, left-wing people uh i maybe east is right it started as a, a it's more on the radical radical side of things the anti-vaccine thing but now that trump is seemingly pushing one through really quickly i've noticed a wide swath of people even in one of the debates kamala harris said something like if Donald Trump has anything to do with the vaccine, I won't be. Do you mean I won't be Kamala taking Kamala Harris. What did I say? <laughs> Kamala. Yeah. Is it? What did Kamala. I say? Kamala. 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 The Kamala. easy way to remember it is that her stepkids called her Mamala, which I think is hilarious. Kamala. Okay. Well, she said in, in the debate that she wouldn't take a, a vaccine if Trump was a part of it. Which well, is that's not exactly what she said. She basically was saying in context that if scientists said it was good, she would take it. But if just Trump said it was good, she wouldn't. You that's know, true. Which, she did. She did qualify. Which is it. reasonable. Yeah. But I mean, you know. do, are you saying that Donald Trump would lie about the efficacy of a medicine in <laughs> order to gain political advantage? No, no but way. here here's where I do think it's a little bit dangerous to say that, though. If the scientists say it's a good vaccine. And also Trump goes around touting it as a miracle cure because he's so excited that there is a good vaccine. Well, then 
all of a sudden it opens up this question mark of like, well, Trump is saying it made me two inches taller, though. You know what I mean? And <laughs> right. Do you see what I mean? Where it's like it could yeah, be a no, good that's, vaccine, that's but Trump will oversell you, it. And then that's why you'd have to it. be a complete moron to like undercut public health officials. You know, it just I agree. It yeah. erodes <laughs> trust in, in public health. So I, I, this is this is one of those things where this is a controversial podcast statement, and I don't mean to sound cold and heartless. But the thing that has sucked about COVID so far is that people can be stupid and they might be fine, but they might spread the disease to other people who will die. So once there's a vaccine out and people just don't want to be vaccinated for whatever stupid reason, there's still a little bit of that because there will be some people who are unable to take vaccines for whatever reason. But for the most part, your stupidity will only affect yourself. And I'm really looking forward to that phase of the disease survivorship bias right so it's like there's this whole thing where it's like i can go to a party and hang out and have people cough all over me and i can come home and feel fine and then i'll tell everyone oh covid's fake like you don't need to do anything <laughs> sure, yeah because it worked for me you know yeah well it's it's confirmation <laughs> bias it's like like you know herman cain died after going to a rally but just no one really talks about that you know think of all the hundreds he talks of people about it on his own twitter after his own death saying <laughs> I, i'm feeling great you haven't seen that the herman cain's twitter just keeps t- I, talking I about how COVID isn't a big deal. He like sold it to some corporation. So, like, That's amazing. The, the tweets go like, COVID isn't a big deal. Don't wear a mask. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm having fun at this party and him without a mask. And then uh, then it's like, unfortunately, Herman Cain has died. That's like a tweet. And then the next one's like, the left-wing media is still blowing COVID out of proportion. It's like, bro, you're dead. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, don't, I don't really do Twitter, but uh, that's hilarious. Like I, I've never really understood the appeal of Twitter, but I that is very funny. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, making this movie, uh, how did you, uh, if I, if I was going to go about making a movie, one of the first things I would think about was, um, how do you get the funds together for it? Like how do you get money? I can tell you how not to do it. And this will be a great part of the story. So, uh, you know, I did it very punk. I basically, you know, I had, I saved up a little bit of money myself, which I guess isn't very punk. Did you have a job uh, at the time or what? I didn't. I, uh, what did I, yeah, I, did, I guess I did. I had a recording studio and I would mm-hmm. record bands and stuff. Okay. Um, and, oh no. You know what? I had the money from my real estate business. What was that? <laughs> and my real estate business was just buying a house in DC and then a bunch of white people moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I bought, I bought a house in, uh, in uh, Columbia Heights, the neighborhood in DC in 2001 or so after I got home from tour and then like literally all these white people started buying houses in the neighborhood and the prices just went crazy. So I took, I kept, I was living off of pretty much taking loans out against the value of my You're house. living off the white people. Uh, dude, it was like, it shine. was like the dumbest thing. So the, the financial crash was the uh-huh. most uh, of 2007 or whatever or eight was the most predictable thing ever. And I knew it was going to happen because I bought a house after being the singer in a punk band for a hundred dollars down <laughs> 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 and doing this thing called stated income. Right. And uh-huh. so you don't have to like, you didn't have to like show any paperwork or tax forms or W twos or anything. You just had to say what your stated income was going to be. And I could say, I think I'm going to make like $100,000 a year next year. And that was the basis for me qualifying for this loan. Literally bought a house with $100 down. I was like, there is no way there's not going to be a giant crash after this. <laughs> so, um, so did you ever have to, did your like a uh, loan blow up on you and you had to walk away from your house or did the value? No, no it worked out and- fine. I sold it. Uh, I sold it before the crash. So it oh, worked out. Um, nice. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, I on paper made so much money, but I, I walked away with like $10,000 when I sold it because I'd already spent it all. You know, like I'd borrowed against it. But so that was, uh, I used that money to like, do some music projects and to, uh, to make the movie. Cool. But I also, uh, and this is the part where, you know, this is a more of a warning, do not do this. I kind of had a bunch of friends and just like casual acquaintances who were like, dude, that's awesome that you're making a movie. I'll put in some money. Right. Mm-hmm. And never like had like contracts or actually got the money uh, in advance. And so what ended up happening was we started the production of the movie and then a few people backed out. And it wasn't like, you know, what are, what are you going to do, right? It's like someone says they can give you some money and then they can't for, you know, whatever reason, it doesn't even matter. Now I was on the hook to pay all these people money and it totally screwed over so many people. What, like and the actors was, and stuff? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, like the cr- the actors, the crew, everybody, right? So I had to like really scramble, and then uh, I had to spend like the next two years of my life giving every cent I had to people to pay off credit cards and pay back everyone I owed money. Really, to. It was really, it was so crappy. So, so someone said, "Yeah, man, I'll give you ten grand f- to help you with that movie," right. and then you went and spent ten grand, and then they said, "Sorry, oh, yeah. I can't, I can't so give it, you that ten grand." It wasn't even, it wasn't even that it was spent. It was just like. You, there's expenses in making the movie that are kind of ongoing. So like, you know, you fly in the actors, you, you know, get them a place to live, all that stuff. You have to feed everybody. Obviously um, we, we made vegan food for everyone, which was great. And then at the, at the, one of my, I, I hadn't watched the movie in a long time. And my favorite joke in the whole movie is at the end, but I, I don't want to spoiler it, but I don't think this is a spoiler, but it, it has a little thing where it's like, you know, no animals were harmed during the making of this movie at the end. There are no animals in the movie. But then it's like, you know, vegan catering was provided throughout. So I thought that was really sweet. Uh, anyway, that made me laugh after having not seen it for years. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, there were all these expenses. And there's like, there's like developing. Once you're done with the actual film. Now, we filmed this on film. This was the mm-hmm. other problem. This was before digital cameras had really come into their own. Mm-hmm. And if I had just waited a year or two, we could have just shot it on digital and saved like $50,000, which would have been amazing. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, you get through the actual filming part and then you have to like pay to develop the film, which is ridiculously expensive. Like you mm. wouldn't think so, but it's so much money. The bulk of the budget of the film was just paying for the actual film. Mm. We shot it on super 16 millimeter, which is, uh, you know, like, uh, it's what they used to shoot. They used to use it to shoot like NFL games and stuff. It's like a legitimate film, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, uh, so that was where, that was where we ran into trouble because after the movie was made, now it's like, okay, you've made this movie, but you can't see it. (laughs) (laughs) You've all you've done is spend a bunch of money to get these boxes of film. Um, and until you have more money, you can't do it. So it took me a really long time to actually get the movie edited and finished. So first piece of advice have your money situation planned out and locked away before you start making the movie. Yeah. And second piece of advice is don't, don't use film, use digital technology. Use uh, digital. That is, yes, don't use film. Would that, mean um, that, would that mean that you guys, after you shot it, did you have to actually edit it by cutting the film and, and taping it together? Or did you upload it to digital and then edit? Yeah. What you do is you just upload the whole reel to digital. Like mm-hmm. you, you do, it's, uh, you do one really high quality transfer of the whole reel Mm-hmm. And then you just edit that. I mean, there's more steps, but basically that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was, which was really fun. It was all really interesting. I mean, it was the same thing when I owned a recording studio, it was actual tape and you had to use like a razor blade to cut the tape to edit it. And then in the later years, you could just put everything you could record on tape, then move it to digital and do all your editing there. I think so I did digital a revolution has really touched my life in many, many ways. I think I did a, I think I did a similar thing. Um, I just, my band sucked, so no one wanted to put out our record. And uh, I, we were going to put it out ourselves, whatever. It's fun, DIY. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's going to cost... The first the first record I ever put out was a 7-inch, and someone else was going to put it out for us, but he, like, was gung-ho about our band, and he wanted to put it out, uh, and he, like, paid most of the stuff. So he paid like eighteen hundred bucks or something, but then he didn't have the four hundred dollars left over to pay this plant to actually release the vinyl to us. And right. actually, it sat at the place for like a year plus because he didn't have the four hundred bucks and we didn't have the four hundred bucks. <laughs> Dude, Good Clean Fun had the exact same problem with our first seven inch. We, uh, we, uh, the guy who was pressing it had sent it off to the pressing plant, but then owed them money and they wouldn't release it, and so it took like forever to come out. Yeah, that, that's a very common thing that happened. That happened. That's happened to me on a bunch of different projects. It's like, yeah, man, we're gonna have the record for the tour, and then it's like a yeah, year nope. later, and it's like maybe for the <laughs> totally. next summer tour we'll, we might have it. Yeah. I, I don't know. And it's just sitting there. You have all new songs by then. Yeah, I had a similar thing too when we were putting out our own record once without any help, and um, one of our friends said, "Oh, hey, I've, I've been saving up a bunch of money uh, from this job. Uh, do you want me to chip in?" Uh, and I said. Okay, sure. So they chipped in like 300 bucks or something like that. And uh, the deal was, you know, as we sold them, uh, we all split up the money, right? So I was in it for like a grand. My brother was in it for like a grand. And one of our friends was in it for like 300 bucks, right? Of course, we're not selling these records, right? Again, band sucks, okay? (laughs) So 
I haven't made any money back. My brother hasn't made any money back. But then our friend starts being like, I need my money back. Right. Like, pay me my money back. And we're like, yeah, but we've sold like two records. Like, there's all these costs. Like, there's, this is not a profitable enterprise. Um, I ended up like years later, uh, once I find that my money situation was a little bit better in my life, I ended up being like, here's 300 bucks back. But like, we never sold those records. Like I still right. have them. <laughs> like that was our deal. Our deal was we were going to pay you back, yeah. but look, yeah, here's the I mean, money. It's, so. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like the problem. It's really funny because when you're punk and you really just don't have like a job and you're, or you're in a band or whatever, like small amounts of money are so significant. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, like, you know, you're talking about 300 bucks to not be able to do a record or whatever. Right. You know? Like it's crazy how, um, how little money makes such a big difference when you don't have any money. It's huge. I remember when I went, one of the first jobs I ever got was I was just getting a job to save up money to go on tour. Right. Cause our band again, it sucked. So sure, sure, not know. enough people come to the shows. We're not getting paid enough. So we're pretty much paying for our own tours. Um, Begs the question, why are you touring, right? There's it's no fun. demand, it's no vacation. demand for it. It's better than taking a vacation. Um, but so I, I remember our guitarist like didn't, didn't have like the $400 and then like, didn't want to, didn't want to get a job to like save up the 400 bucks. So I think it was like a whole big issue where he had to borrow the money or something like that. Crazy. Yeah. So uh, just to spice this episode up a little, I feel like we should do more trash talking. Like, I, I don't know if we've met our quota. Oh, wait, <laughs> let's talk about, let's talk about the, uh, um, the other day, Bill said, Isa, um, happy edge day. And you were like, I don't celebrate edge day. Bill was like, what are you talking about? And then you were like, edge day dissed me back in 1976. And we're like, yeah, exactly. Isa, no, so what are you 1999. saying? 1999. So edge day was, uh, so, okay. There are a couple cities that always, that good clean fun did not do well. In. Like, I feel like we, we were pretty much the same. We could go, we traveled all over like the world. Final tap. Yeah, it's not a rock and roll town. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, but there, Boston's not a much of a college town. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Boston, Massachusetts, and Richmond, Virginia are the two cities where we like. I don't know how else to describe it, but we just like underperformed significantly. You know, those are those are serious towns. Those well, are, those towns take it serious. I want to yeah, beat no, people they did. down. They, they don't want not, no goddamn jokes. They did not appreciate <laughs> the humor, and it's it's really weird because it, it's so you we would go on a tour. We mm -hmm. play, we're the same every night, you know, we play the same songs. We'd have, you know, so much fun everywhere. Then we get to Richmond, <laughs> like the three worst shows we ever played were all in Richmond. <laughs> you know, it's just like people just standing there like, you guys suck, you know, like, <laughs> okay, we don't know why you hate us, but sorry, we're not <laughs> tough guys. Um, it was weird. And I have really good hardcore friends in Richmond and Boston, and no one's ever really been able to explain to me. But, I think I can explain Boston. Oh, right. oh, please I, do, because I have an even better explanation. But let's hear yours first. Uh, so, <laughs> I, maybe the maybe the most Isa statement I've ever heard. Oh, Isa yeah. has a better explanation. But why don't we go ahead and hear yours first, Bill? Let's yeah. go for it. So, <laughs> all right, every, and then afterwards, every, you judge who's yeah. better. I just know that mine is like going to be really good. Okay. <laughs> Everybody in Massachusetts <laughs> thinks they're funny already. So mm. when somebody comes in with a little, and they present themselves humorous or anything like that, they're like, this guy isn't fucking funny, you know? And so they're, who's this fucking clown? This guy's a fucking clown. Who is this guy coming in here? And so that's a, a Massachusetts attitude of every okay. like, fucking comedian. What are these comedians? I'm funnier than this guy. And that's, uh, that's Massachusetts in a nutshell. Uh, so my that comedy, is what my I, comedy band went over pretty big in Boston. Huh. Uh, weird. Okay. So, so here's my theory, right? So uh, there was a band called reach the sky and mm -hmm. the singer hated me, right? <laughs> like I never knew why. So I, I finally figured it out, but this is, this is a funny story. So all these people would be like, come up to me and be like, man, Ian really hates you. Right? Like Ian reach the sky. He hates you. what did you do to him? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I barely know the guy, you know? So I heard that multiple times. People were just like, this guy hates you. You have to try to get him on your podcast and he can tell his side of the story. But, uh, <laughs> so he's, like, my, he's like, leave me alone. I'm a realtor now. <laughs> so my only, I never really had any real interaction with him. I mean, we played some shows together, we'd hung out, uh, never really hung out or anything, I, you know. Uh, um, 
And so all these people from Boston didn't like me. I was like, okay. Well, this is about, about, this is winding up to be that McGruber thing. And yeah, <laughs> totally. you know, I, I fucked you know, his like, wife just, and, you know, exactly. I like, ruined I'm gonna his find business. Out that, like I made out with his mom or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. But, uh, but so, so the one, the, so someone uh, finally was like, oh, he told me why he doesn't like you. It's because you guys were dicks about money or something, mm. right? So what happened, what really happened was, we were playing some shows in Canada. They needed to get on a show. And so we, we our Mike fight, our bass player booked, booked our shows and he added them to one of our shows in Canada. So we ended up playing a show in Canada together. And then after the show, Ian and I, and whoever were representing the other bands all went backstage to collect the money. So we're sitting with the promoter and he's like, how do you want to do the money? I was supposed to give good, clean fun, like, you know, 200 loonies or whatever the hell Canadians use for money. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, uh, and I was like, well, why don't we just do 50, 50, right? Like it was our show. We had, they, they got play. added to your show and you agreed to 50, 50. I always agree to 50, 50. It's like, fucking okay, well that, uh, that's, <laughs> that's generous. If it's your show, well, you're promoted. They needed a show and you added them on. Well, again, I, I just want to bring you back to like, it was only like $200. So it okay. wasn't like, you know, whatever. What's the difference, right? Yeah. So, uh, so, <laughs> so the promoter counts out the money, and there was a, it was an odd number. So it was one extra dollar, right? <laughs> so I say, in what is obviously a joking voice, well, it was our show, so we'll take the extra dollar, right? And I grab the <laughs> dollar off the table, <laughs> and apparently that pissed him off, and he thought I was being a dick about money, and so that was like his. He didn't tell the whole story, apparently. But the, you have a one dollar punk act. feud, is what you're telling me. <laughs> exactly, uh, one loony. Punk. <laughs> I know. <what> <laughs> Now, here's, here's what happened. This guy, so they weren't able to fill up the van with that extra dollar worth of gasoline. They got stranded in Dedham, uh, and then they couldn't make it back to Boston, and it just it just fucked them, you know, because then they had to have a friend come out with their van, and yeah, I mean, I get it. The argument <laughs> exactly. over weird so, Canadian coin money, too, probably, Exactly. Right? So we had a... We had a yeah, loo- I mean, if it was loony- a toonie, if... If yeah, it was a I mean, toonie, I could understand that, but exactly. it was only a loony. It was just a loony. And so, so this was always this weird thing. And, and keep in mind, I didn't know what was happening. I just knew that all these guys in Boston didn't like me. And so uh, when I asked, just to bring this back to the Good Clean Fun movie, when I asked Aaron Bedard uh, for Bane to be in the movie, uh, he was getting all these weird looks from the other guys in his, in his van. The, you know, the, the Reach the Sky people who were in Bane that I don't really know. Uh, you know, and I, I'd known Aaron for a while. We talked a few times, totally nice guy. And I was like, Hey man, can you do this quick interview thing for the movie? And he kind of got these dirty looks from the other guys in the van. And then we went and shot his scene. Um, and I was like, well, that was weird. What was up with that? And then it was just like, I never understood. And then I finally figured out that it's over that loony. Yeah, man. Uh, I, uh, (laughs) my, my punk feuds were always a little bit more like, Hmm, why is that guy being so mean to me? And then it's like, Oh, I spit on his friend's face and then hit him with a steel chain during a show. <laughs> yeah, no, and you never, never did so. Like that. Yeah, it's, well, it's been in a coma for three and a half years. <laughs> I one time had a guy, I'm driving on the Bay Bridge and I have a guy stick his head out the window and show me a scar on his face over and over and over again. He's honking his horn and he's pointing to a scar on his face. And I'm like, <laughs> okay cool, cool scar. I, I don't recognize this guy right but he seems very upset with me weird i just keep driving about my day uh i tell my friends i'm at band practice i'm like this guy's blah, blah, blah. months go by and i hear that this guy had gone to a show that i had booked in oakland um one of the bands playing uh urban struggles uh from arizona they're one of those wild bands there's like they're they were just wild guys right okay. and uh they took it too far. You know, I'd seen their shows where it's like sometimes the whole room was just like engulfed in fireworks and you couldn't breathe and stuff. It's, they were just, that you know, doesn't sound very safe. <laughs> no, never. It was never safe, they, but they were like known as like, they're not a safe band. They're always pushing it too far. Just, you know, feeding off of each other. It's just a okay. back. Anyways. Um, I had booked them at some show at, you know, DIY illegal sort of spot and my band played. It's great. I think this is the night actually that um, I stripped down to my underwear and then someone pulled my underwear down on stage and flashed a picture. Horrible night for me. Okay. Oh no, your shrimp dick was, was out <laughs> to the world? dick was straight up. So they coordinated it, right? So I was doing this like um, Ric Flair 
like I was, I was stealing jokes from Ric Flair about where I take off all my clothes and say how expensive they are before throwing them in the audience. Okay. Like it doesn't matter to me. Sure. Uh, like this coat's worth $500. It's worth more than a month's rent in your dump of an apartment. And I throw it in the audience. Like I don't care. Right. <laughs> and so I'm stripping down. And then <laughs> I, I have a question. Did you have friends in the audience that you would throw these to so you could get your clothes back? Like with, no, these were, were these plans? are like thrift store eighties, very okay. ridiculous looking outfits. Yes. Where it, but it, you it had a matter. change of clothes, like you know, it was. Uh, I had I had street clothes that I came to the show and I would change before we played. Right. Uh, anyways, two of my friends, well, thought they were my friends, uh, had coordinated <laughs> a thing where one of them went and had a camera ready, mm-hmm. and the other one pulled down the spandex boxers that I was wearing on stage and then snapped a picture. And so there's this picture out there of me holding onto my spandex underwear desperately, like with a panic look on my face. And it's like a blurry picture where I'm trying to cover myself up. And uh... anyways, long story short, the guy with the scar, he tells me, or I hear from a friend that uh, later on that show, Urban Struggles, uh, turned off the lights, broke a mirror, took the shards of glass and threw them in the audience. And huh. that guy got cut by one of the pieces of glass and wow. he blames me, the promoter, which I guess is fair enough. You know, sure. I mean, I guess, you know, well, I didn't so throw the glass. You, you, <laughs> you made this guy look cool for the rest of his life by booking a show. And he's not mad? a thank you. Not even a thank you. Yeah. We should have him on the podcast. I mean, look, I feel, I don't, I didn't want him to get hurt. I mean, geez, I you should do a whole podcast about like people that have been horribly wronged by bands or something, you know? It'd be a long list. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll get Ian on here to talk about the loony. And, so, uh, yeah. But dude, if you had him, if you guys had booked a show and someone else was climbing on the show, I would argue you shouldn't have gone 50 50 with them. I personally feel like if they're, especially if they're hopping on last minute and they're not adding to the people who are coming to the show, it's kind of, those are your guys' 200 loonies or whatever. So, I mean, I got to say, like, I feel like from a, I, I mean, whatever. I understand that there are some times when you're in like dire financial straits as a band. Mm-hmm. Um, but good clean fun was always like a 50, 50 band. Like whenever we had a lot of really bad experiences when we like, so we were like one of the last independent. Okay. That, that sounds too dramatic. Let me, let me back that up. We were one of the last independent hardcore bands who didn't use a booking agent, mm-hmm. like, uh, in the era of, uh, this was like maybe the late nineties, early two thousands we played a ton of shows where everyone else on the bill had a booking agent and we mm-hmm. just booked the shows ourselves. Mm-hmm. So what would end up happening is, you know, even, even shows where we headlined or co-headlined or, or whatever, we're playing high up in the bill, we would get way less money than everyone else. Mm-hmm. And what, what the reason was, you know, Hey, uh, you played a show with, I'm not going to name any bands, but you played a show with band X who might actually be a real band. I don't know. It sounds like a cool name. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, you guys totally headlined, but if I don't give them their guarantee, then next week I won't be able to do, you know, the get up kids show or whatever, whatever Mm -hmm. big band show at the time. And so we played a bunch of shows where like every band got way more money than we did. And that was like, you know, whatever, that's just how it was. But it was like, I felt the booking agents were ruining hardcore, no offense to my booking agent friends. Um, and so whenever we, yeah, and were those, uh, were those booking agents, the, the guys out of Boston, were they the booking agents too? Cause they had a, a, a pretty big, uh, thing that, you know, ran Hydrahead records and all like that thing that, uh, I mean, there, it, were, uh, there were, in, a in a tech. Of, there were in a bunch of the one booking agents from, I mean, from all over. And I feel like we were friends with most of them, but it was like, uh, it was just like a thing where bands had booking agents now. Like you know hardcore bands didn't used to have booking agents. And then all of a sudden they all had booking agents. You know what I hate about hardcore booking agents is uh, they keep sending full lineups and it's, mm-hmm. they send these packages right. where it's like five bands. Right. It's so annoying. It's like, so there's no local bands on the show. Right. Like how Especially am I supposed to, to fucking five band shows? It's yeah. How, how am I going to fucking yeah. promote this, this bill? Uh, Totally. I've always been a little weirded out by hardcore booking agents too. I understand if you're in a pop, your band was more popular than mine. I feel like maybe if it gets to, to be too much work, it makes sense to have a friend sort of pick up the slack and have a booking agent. No, for sure. I, I guess it's not, it's not just the having a booking agent. It's the idea of having guarantees and then not giving pe- you know, like gu- guarantees suck. Like, I mean, like mm-hmm. I understand why people do them obviously, but like, I feel like a bunch of punk should be able to play a show without guarantees being involved, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, like we, but anyway, so my point is whenever we were in a situation where it was like a question of splitting up money, we tried to do 50, 50, it just seems like, it's like, look, you're here too. We're all here. Let's just split them up. 
guarantees are guarantees are pretty weird. There's also it's like, look, man. So, okay. So for those who don't know, guarantee is like a band. Instead of taking ninety percent of the door or seventy percent of the door, some bands say if we play a show, you have to guarantee that you're going to pay us four thousand dollars at the end of the night. Um, and it makes sense because what it does is it puts the onus on the promoter to actually promote the show, right? The show has to go well or the promoter is going to lose money. So they're incentivized because a lot of times you show up in a place and someone goes, yeah, well, I kind of, I don't know. I kind of yeah. forgot to promote this one or whatever, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, I made a Facebook uh, event, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but what, there's another negative effect to it too, which is what you end up doing a lot of the times if, you're, if your guarantee is too high, you end up just finding the dumbest promoter. You end up yeah. finding the guy in town who's willing to take take or who doesn't know but is about to take a loss and doesn't really know what he's doing is going to not promote the show very well not put on the right bands and just not really handle the situation right you get your four thousand dollars but no one's going to know that you played no one's going to be there right (laughs) Right. if you would have taken the 70 percent split with the actual underground diy punk scene that would put you in the cool spot it'd be a fucking bustling house party type of a show um and you'd have this night of your life and your band would become more popular with more influential people but instead, you played at some stupid fucking bar uh, booked by a weirdo totally. who's just going to so write you we, a check for 800 we, we bucks. Tried a, we the tried bar a was a 21 plus bar as yeah. well. You know, it yeah. doesn't even make sense for a hardcore show. My straight edge totally. band had played, my straight edge band played a couple 21 plus bar shows like on accident on tour with like zero paid. Sweet. Yeah. We uh we used a booking agent one time. Uh, uh, I forget what year it was, but it was in the later years of Good Clean Fun. We tried it with someone who worked for Equal Vision, I think, or with them. Uh, they, we played at a church <laughs> and we played at a 21 plus bar. So I had to sneak underage kids into a bar, which was awesome. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, I had to play at a church and the rules were you weren't allowed to curse. <laughs> oh, you played a no cursing show. I we ran played, that. And we played, Oh my God, it was amazing. We played with some like Christian hardcore band who had like three singers and were like the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. It was unintentionally funny. Oh, completely unintentionally. I mean, I think they thought they were amazing. Uh, Three (laughs) Christian singers. Oh yeah. Like I wish I could remember the name of the band, but it was like some church in California. Probably called praise him. No, no. I want to say, I don't, I'm really, I'm really, uh, I don't want to name the wrong band and this would just be ridiculous, but they were, they were like popular in the Christian hardcore scene. Uh, yeah, Ugh. it was crazy. So, uh, so yeah, so I gave a whole bunch of speeches. I, I gave a speech about, you know, uh, how people who believe in religion are dumb, but did it without cursing. So, you know, <laughs> that was, uh, that was my, my goal. So that was, that was a disaster. Basically. I had run the, the, have you ever played a no cursing show by someone else? And I remember them saying no. And I was like, Hmm, that's weird. Most punks have at least played one no cursing show. I don't think I could do it. I mean, our songs all, I had a rule that we only would curse once per record. So there's like one curse word on each record and no more. It's like getting an R rating or whatever. <laughs> um, but, uh, but just talking about stuff, it just it would be difficult to not slip a curse in there once in a while. I think we played at uh, a skating rink. There's little kids' birthday parties. Oh. No cursing in the microphone. That doesn't sound like your band would fit at that show. Very well. This was like my high school band and we didn't oh, okay. fit, but there's, <laughs> there's this, you know, this, that there's like a certain type of local business. Um, one of the things that the punks in my scene would do would be, there was no venues and most of the legit venues like wouldn't let us play or they had very weird rules and you had to bring forward of your friends. And like, we just couldn't right. fit pay right? to play and stuff. Yeah. Pay to play and all sorts of like, you had to pay to buy a recording of yourself afterwards. Is that like yeah. some music lesson place? Um, so what a lot of kids would do, particularly like the Hayward punks, they would walk around businesses and knock on doors and say, do you have an extra room? Do you have a party room? Like a right. Jack Cusar places. Like, can we just, have a concert in your Cusar place. And the guy'd be like, right. you, what you'd end up doing is you find struggling business owners. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and you'd be like, can I give you 200 bucks to let me set up this PA system and make a bunch of racket? And they're like, I, I guess, you know, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. The, the big shows in DC when I was a kid uh, was at a place called the Safari club, which was like this, like dance club that uh, the promoters, the hardcore kids just approached and were like, Hey, can we do shows here during the daytime? You know, like, can we do matinees here? worked out great what was like your first hardcore show well and, and uh, I think how did was, you end up there uh it was government issue and uh i i knew i i you know i knew the band like i didn't know i they weren't I, they weren't like my favorite band or anything but i just got into punk music and a friend just took me like an older friend 
Uh, and it was, uh, it was awesome. And then I love telling the story and I apologize if I've told either of you the story many times, but, um, we played a show years later, uh, and, and John Stab was there. And while I was talking to him and I was telling him, Hey, you know, my first hardcore show 30 years ago or whatever was at a government issue show, a little kid came up to me and was like, this is my first hardcore show. <laughs> and it was like this really cute, like moment of like three generations of hardcore kids or whatever. So, you know, if you're that kid and you're listening, reach out. Yeah. Government issue. That's, that's a, that's a pretty good uh, first, first show. My first was like uh, the addicts catch 22. Those were some of my first shows. Nice. I, I thought it was funny that I saw the addicts as like one of my first shows. Cause it's like, they started in like one of the first punk bands, you know, just never stop. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, it's funny because I grew up, you know, I grew up in D.C. And so I, if I had been a few years older, I would have seen all sorts of bands that I wish I'd seen. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? So did like, so did like, uh, was Fugazi broken up? No, no, no. Fuga you mean when I started going to shows or what do you mean? You said like you would have seen a bunch of other bands. Was it like Minor Threat had broken up? Tell yeah, me about yeah. That. Minor Threat had broken up. Like I started going to shows in about like 1980. I started going to... By like 1986, seven, I was going to shows regularly. I think my first show might have been in '85, but uh, but Minor Threat broke up in you know '83, so I just missed it by a few years. So bummer. You know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> when was Revolution Summer? When what year was that? I think that's like what like '84 or five, something okay. like that. So after Minor Threat, after Revolution Summer, you show up and you're like, hey, guys, are we done making history here? Let's, yeah, exactly. Let's go to some <laughs> if, shows. If you're curious about a more in-depth history, you should go, Bill, you should uh, send people a link to our Edgeland discussion. I feel like we talked about that a lot. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I, I do think that no matter what, though, everybody thinks that they missed out. I mean, it, it is tough to say that, um, you know, being one or two years late to Minor Threat, you definitely missed out on something there. But uh, we had Walter from Gorilla Biscuits on the show uh, a couple months back, and he, he was like, oh, yeah, I feel like I missed out on the best hardcore. It's like, you played in the best hardcore. What the fuck are you talking <laughs> totally. about? That was so weird. He was like, he was like, yeah, man, hardcore. Pfft, I missed it. I'm like, yeah. yeah, I don't think that you did. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it is funny that, I mean, that's hilarious for Walter because that's, you know, obviously like it's this generation has lasted longer, you know, like, so it seems like, but, you know, I mean, the, the early, I could see how like the late seventies or like, if you, you know, bad brains, like seeing bad brains and, or whatever. Um, yeah. It, it, everyone has their own thing and it always seems like the scene was better a few years ago, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Like Issa, if, if you listen to uh, to Minor Threat Salad Days, it's sort of like those lyrics could have been written at any point in hardcore, and they would still make just. Smoke. Bill, didn't you write a Hard Times headline about this? Uh, something like uh, Straight Edge uh, Elder it was, recounts. It was, it was a hardcore historian recounts glory days of three years ago. So that was. <laughs> nice. uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, Issa. Um, Tell me a little bit about the uh, cameos in your movie and then tell people where they can see your movie. Okay. Well, they can see it uh, on YouTube shortly. By the time this is released, it'll be up on YouTube. Uh, and I believe What's it called? You find What's it, it, they Google? it's called good, clean, fun, the movie. Okay. So that's going to be hard to remember for people, but good, clean, fun, the movie. <laughs> Not Nick Bain. Issa, Issa came to a, to a hard times party, right? We're working on Outvoice together and uh, our live events coordinator fucking marked out. He goes, <gasps> That's Mr. Issa. This guy's a fucking legend. <laughs> I need to get him to do that again when my kids are around, you know, try to convince them that I used to be cool. Yeah, uh, I remember you were there and you said, don't look me in the eye, you prick. And then, oh, yeah, that's how I roll. And then I stole a loony off his merch table. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, the movie's going to be on YouTube. It's completely free. Uh, it was, I, so... The plot of the movie, just really quickly, is that the Good Clean, Good Clean Fun has sold out, changed our name to the Good Clean Funds, and we've become like the biggest band in the world. And so um, I tried to get pretty much anyone I could to, anyone from the hardcore scene I could to give like cameo interviews. So we did like a, there's kind of like a behind the music kind of segment in the movie where they interview some other bands. And uh, it's like, you know, like uh, Aaron from Bane. Thomas from Strike Anywhere. Or Cell says that you're his, uh, like his guru. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I tried to think of like, what's the funniest <laughs> thing I can get each band to say about me. And so 
Uh, Andy Hurley from <laughs> Fallout Boy talks about how big we are. I think Carl and, from uh, Earth Crisis says that you guys like laid the spiritual, moral foundation, foundation, ethical yeah. foundation for the same. Yeah, and you know, yeah. Porcel says I'm like a guru to him. <laughs> like yeah, it was hilarious, everybody. you know. And my my favorite being Aaron uh, from Bane saying that we sell a lot of T-shirts. You know? <laughs> right as all his friends are right off camera looking at him like, how dare exactly. you talk to Issa <laughs> exactly. that fucking? So, don't you uh, know what he did to Ian? <laughs> and uh yeah and uh dana diarmond who is a uh porn star had a nice little cameo appearance uh she's an old straight edge kid from florida and uh it was it was fun i pretty much got anybody i could get to be in it and uh you know h2o and uh I'm, i hope i'm not forgetting anyone because i'd be oh adam and his package has the best uh the best cameo of all time uh it's amazing he's, he's a dc guy right no he's from philly okay Close enough. Close, close enough to all you Boston people, you know, yeah. like whatever. You're not, you're either from Boston or you're from wherever. Who cares? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Google Good Clean Fun, the movie, and you'll find it on YouTube, uh, made by our friend Issa. And uh, this podcast has to wrap up because I'm about to try to sell Outvoice. I have an Outvoice customer meeting. Uh, right. Issa and, Issa and I work on Outvoice <laughs> together. Are you just going to, just going to, roll that over like i leave and then this uh, link gets sent out to uh, i think yeah, maybe we should add him into the podcast like, <laughs> totally <laughs> let me tell you uh, have you tried using this software <laughs> yeah uh so isa uh thanks for coming on man uh come back soon uh appreciate you it's an interesting way that our lives have become intertwined with two totally. punk kids who end up running a, a tech company oh, um, yeah. which will one day be uh bigger than facebook um. <laughs> Definitely. Wait. Well, so with Facebook's steep decline as it goes mm. on this downward, then that's and true. On the, you know, like this. Bill's just, got a good point. We could do just, just try to survive, just technically keep ourselves mm. alive for like thirty years and wait for Facebook to like, you know. Actually, I don't know. I feel like Facebook, even in thirty years, even if it collapsed, it would still be pretty big because like MySpace is still pretty big, even though it collapsed, right? Are they? Is no, MySpace still pretty MySpace big? is like done, done. You oh, know, done, like, done. I thought they had like yeah. tried to restart. They it. did a comeback, but I don't think it came back. They yeah, couldn't like get Justin Tila Timberlake. Tequila. <laughs> yeah, yeah they Justin Timberlake Tila. invested, and in, uh, yeah, but no, they're they're toast. So there will be if if Outvoice stays on the you know flat line that it is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, Facebook will eventually intersect on its downslope, and then boom, you got it. So that's the that's yeah. the one we're all waiting for. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, all right, thanks boys. Thanks for having me, guys. That was good times. Yeah, yeah it's good talking to both of you. Talk to you soon. All right, see you soon.